Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are a real, real Father. You've been speaking to us like fathers speak to their loving children. And we thank you because of the things you are imparting to our lives. Thank you for all the decisions we are taking. And thank you, Lord, for the great things we know you are going to do through our lives. And at the end of all those great things, we are going to receive us to heaven. Thank you, Lord, because of our fellowship together and because of our sharing together, because of our learning together. We pray, Lord, that the fellowship, the learning, and the commitment will not end here at the Congress, but it will continue for the rest of our lives in Jesus' name. We pray that you open our eyes of understanding more and more as we go into your word now. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to another session in our leadership series. Already you know that we're taking the letters of the word leadership. And we're digging deep into the characteristics and the qualities required in leaders in the church of the living God. We've looked at L, love in Christ-like leadership. E, effectiveness of, com of competent, leader competent leadership. And A, anointing for consecrated leaders. D, discipline of crucified leaders. E, exploits of charismatic leaders. R, resourcefulness of creative leaders. S, the signs for commissioned leaders. H is what we're looking at now, holiness in Christian leaders. Then we'll be getting to I, intercession by compassionate leaders. And then early tomorrow morning, there will be the progress through courageous leadership. Now we come to the H part of the leadership series. That is the holiness. We look at Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, I'm reading from verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, ye that be clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. When he talks about bearing the vessels of the Lord, he's talking about those who are leaders, those who are workers, those who have something precious from the Lord. And the Lord has given the precious ointment and the precious gift and the precious heritage and the precious word and the precious anointing. And then he puts that in a vessel. And that vessel is the leader himself. And as you carry that and you bear that, the Lord is saying, if that what you have in the vessel is not going to be contaminated, it's not going to be unclean, it's not going to be useless and unprofitable. You need to do something. Get out of the midst of the people that will corrupt and contaminate what you have in your vessel. That's why the Lord is saying, be ye holy, be ye clean, be ye pure, be ye sanctified, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. Depart ye, he said, depart ye. And if you look at those words, depart ye, repeated two times for emphasis. It's an imperative. It's a commandment. It is something that is urgent, that this is what to do. Looks like those leaders in Israel had been very, very slow in coming out of the things or the surrounding that will corrupt them or that will desecrate them. Or that will make them unqualified for the service of the Lord. And then the Lord said, as a matter of urgency, and as a matter of decision, and as a matter of determination, and something that continues all through your life, as long as you see yourself as vessels unto honor, bearing the precious thing that you are going to deliver to the people I'm sending you to, depart ye. And once you depart, keep away from that area. Depart ye. Go ye out from this. Touch no unclean thing. While my hand is on you and I'm touching you. Touch no unclean thing. While I touch your lips. And I put the eternal word, the saving word, soul saving word on your lips. 
touch no unclean thing while you're expecting a touch from the lord that will pass his virtue and his power into your life when you want to minister then you touch no unclean thing and while you're expecting that the touch of heaven of the life gold taken from the altar of the lord will touch your lips and while you're waiting for that touch you make sure that you do not touch any unclean thing but that you will go out of the midst of her of the midst of which place if you happen to have been in egypt out of egypt if you happen to have been in babylon out of babylon that you will go out whenever you read the scripture you must always connect what you are reading from what that writer in particular himself had said earlier and if you make the connection you will understand the sense in which isaiah the prophet is saying go out go out of that place and do not touch any unclean thing we're looking at isaiah chapter 48 verse 20. isaiah chapter 48 verse 20 go ye forth of babylon flee ye from the chaldeans with a voice singing declare of singing declare ye tell this alter it even to the end of the earth say ye the lord has redeemed his servant jacob do not be corrupted by all the corruptions and iniquities of babylon go out of the midst of her because you are bearing the vessel of the lord holiness is very essential holiness is indispensable in leadership without it all else will fail to uphold leadership without holiness all else all other characteristics all other qualities all other weapons that we have will fail to uphold that leader when you look at absalom were it not for the fact of the absence of holiness all the other qualities in that man's life would have qualified him to be a great leader think about ahitophel when ahitophel gave counsel it was like the counsel of an angel were it not for the missing or for the lack or the loss of holiness ahitophel would have been a great great leader and joab what a militant man what a great man what a clever man and what a wise man wise in quotes and what a man can that can bend the strongest of minds in the land and he had his way through he had some influence over the women i could send the so-called wise woman to david and he had an influence over the men and he was a prosperous wealthy man he had it so filled near the field of absalom why it not for the loss or the lack of holiness joab would have been a great great leader and of course we all know something what a mighty man what a powerful man what a great man and were it not for the absence of holiness in the life of Samson, what a long life he would have lived and what a great influence he would have had as you look at Samson, you must if if you make a Samson and david to stay side by side you are going to see that Samson was an exceptional leader an exceptional military leader you know that Samson never raised an army he fought all the battles by himself never had any security around him it was enough security for himself and when he faced the philistines he faced the philistines alone and he never handled a spear or an arrow just the jawbone of an ass that man was mighty and he never used any me any mechanical thing or bulldozer if he needed to take the gate of the city away from there he used his bare hands and he carried the gates away and he entered into that city and he spoiled the whole city that man was a great a, a great military man and yet the lack of holiness the absence of holiness the loss of holiness ruined that man and you think about balaam and if Balaam will stand stand by side with any other prophet in the land of Israel, even talk about Jeremiah, and you talk about Daniel. Here is Balaam that comes and he says, I'm not even closing my eyes. 
and with my eyes open, I see the visions of the Lord. I'm in a trance, and yet I'm awake, and I see even Jesus Christ's shadow, the scepter, and it's coming, and it's far away, but it shall come, because the scepter shall not depart away from Judah, until Shiloh shall come. And then when, ba when Balak said, I caused you to curse the people, and uh, you are blessing them, he said, I told you, I'm going to say what the Lord has given me to say. He said, I see him, and I see Jacob, and I see his children, and he couched like a lion, who shall be alive when all these things shall come to pass? A great prophet, were it not for the lack of holiness. Great men, great leaders, just the absence of holiness. And of course, to remember Solomon, a wise man. A man that was wiser than everybody in his own generation. And you remember the classic story, the classical story of what made his wisdom to go all over the land to women had children. And as these uh, two women had children, they were very, very young. In the night, one slept on the child and the child died. In the morning, each of them claimed the living child. And it came to Solomon. How would you have been able to judge that? And then Solomon said, Now you need to understand that all those people, kings in Israel, they had been told that they should read the Old Testament. And when you have time, you'll check up in your Bible that the farmers have been told, the, the cattle rearers have been told that if uh, you, know, you have a cattle and then one belongs to this and one belongs to that. And the cattle of uh, the sheep of one dies and then the other one, you'll share the living one, you'll share it in two. And then he remembered that. He remembered the, the, the wisdom is in the word of God. And eventually, so give me a sword there. And then he said, I'm going to slash the living child into two. Because you say, Mrs. A, you said it's yours. And Mrs. B, you said it's yours. I'm going to slash the child into two. Give you half and give you the other half. And then um, the one that has the child said, King, don't do that. Let the child be alive and give the child to her. The other woman said, no, that's exactly what we're going to do. Divide the child into two so that it will neither be yours nor mine. And Solomon said, this is the mother. The compassion, the love, the heart of the mother. This is the mother. And that spread throughout the land that people knew God had given wisdom to Solomon. But his flesh will not allow him to rule. Immorality will not allow him to rule. And then he went to the strange women of whom the Lord had told the people of God, you'll not make marriages of them. And God became angry with him. The lack of holiness, the laws of holiness disqualified him. When Saul came out and Samuel said, behold your king standing head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. They gave a great shout, long live the king. But anger, jealousy, envy, wanting to kill, wanting to preserve his position by worldly means, by carnal means, by cruel means, the lack of holiness, the lack of purity of heart, disqualified soul. Absalom, Ahitophel, Joab, Samson, Balaam, Solomon, Saul. The list continues. And the list might be expanded by leaders among us here. Because maybe you didn't know. There is an Absalom in every human being. Look at the government of any nation. There is an Absalom in the cabinet. And look at any group of people anywhere. There is an Absalom in somebody's heart. And there is an Hitophel in everyone. A Joab in someone. There is a Samson. In every leader in the world, there is a Balaam, there is a Solomon, there is a Saul. It is when we go to the Lord and we say, this Absalomic nature in me, wanting to apply 
Absalom's method, policy, diplomacy. Crucify it away from me. And then remove Absalom away from my nature. And remove Ahithophel away from my nature. And Job away from my heart. And remove Samson away from my character. Remove Balaam and Solomon and Saul away from the depth of my heart. And then the space, the emptiness, the hole you create there by removing that Absalom away from me, fill me with the holiness that comes right from the throne of God. That's when you'll be useful as a leader. And I want you to watch out in your leadership. When you're with other people, especially a gifted man, a gifted leader, especially a courageous leader, especially a clever leader, a skillful leader, a competent leader, watch out that the absence of holiness or the lack of holiness will not ruin your life and ruin your ministry and then send you to a place you'll not want to be in eternity. Vision is necessary, but vision minus holiness will be unprofitable. Goal setting is indispensable in leadership, but goal setting minus holiness will not make us to reach heaven's destination. Strategy development is very important if a ministry or leadership is going to be carried forward, but strategy development without holiness will not develop the church. Wisdom. Who can discount wisdom? Who can belittle wisdom? And who can set aside? Who can take to the background wisdom? Wisdom ought to be in the forefront. And wisdom is something we cannot do without, but wisdom minus holiness. That is Solomon minus sanctification. It's not going to make it in leadership. You're not going to get to heaven. Well, the wisdom minus holiness. Courage. On the day of battle, when a leader rises up and there is no trembling in his feet, and there is no fear in his heart and there is no no way of looking back and he looks at the enemy and like david he runs toward goliath that's a great virtue in a leader but courage minus holiness will make you to drag or to or to or to or to uh, grind the meal in uh, the shrine of the enemy like samson did communication ability great how can somebody be a leader without communication ability tell me would hitler have been able to carry the people through at the time of the second world war when he rallied the whole of germany and he wanted to fight against the whole world that man had great fantastic communication ability but then he had a match winston churchill and when you read the address of Winston Churchill to England, we'll fight on the sea, we'll fight on the battlefield, we'll fight on the mountain, we'll fight in the valley until we establish freedom in this land. And eventually, it was the, actually the oratory or the speaking of Winston Churchill that carried them through. And they overcame. But... You might have communication ability, like Winston Churchill or like Hitler. But if you don't have holiness, that communication ability will not carry you farther than it carried Absalom. And it got Absalom to the point he was hanging on the branch of the tree. And Joab said, you saw him, you didn't, you didn't smash him. I will not waste time with you. And he took three darts in his hand. And he smote him. And then Absalom was brought down dead and was buried. And he said, everybody go back to your tents. The battle is over. Without holiness, communication without holiness will not lead the church of the living God. There's something that leaders actually need. We call it staying power. Staying power. That means when the battle is tough. When the noise of the battle is loudest. And when it appears that the heat is so much that the people that don't have staying power, they are running away from the battlefield. 
We need staying power. And we need that staying power to be, to be able to remain in leadership. But do you know, staying power minus holiness again will not make it. You might stay in the church and stay in leadership, but you'll not get to heaven. And assign gifts. Already we've learned about them. And here is Moses coming. And he was coming with the signs in his hand. And here is Joshua. And the Lord said, sanctify yourself because tomorrow I will do wonders in the land. Sign gives. The signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils. But signs minus holiness. You'll hear the Lord saying on the final day, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk in equity and resourcefulness. Great, great, great quality of a leader. That you never can really corner that leader. He has resourcefulness and creativity. If he's going this way and the, and the road is closed and they say there's no way, he knows he, he goes to another way. And if he's going through a particular door and then he meets a steep, closed door. He actually, he knows how to open that door. Or if he cannot open that door, he takes another way and still gets to where he wants to go. Resourcefulness and creativity. Very, very useful to leadership. But resourcefulness minus holiness. Again, it's not going to be able to make it and pave the way into heaven. And that's the reason why holiness is very, very important. All these useful qualities to leadership, they're indispensable. But without holiness, they may even become counterproductive in our leadership. That's why the Lord is reminding us that if there is going to be any leadership that is really going to do the work in these last days, we need holiness. In Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. We're reading from verse 3. Malachi chapter 2 verse 5. Malachi chapter 2 verse 5 My covenant was with him of life and peace and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name the law of truth was in his mouth iniquity was not found in his leaves he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's leaves shall keep knowledge and they shall seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Well then we understand what the Lord is telling us. Holiness righteousness purity they are indispensable if we are going to actually remain in leadership there are three elements or points or parts we're going to look at in the message number one the leaders holiness experience the leaders holiness experience number two the leaders home expression the leaders home expression number three the leaders heavenly expectation the leaders heavenly expectation we come to number one the leaders holiness experience in isaiah chapter six isaiah chapter six reading from verse one in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Let's stay here for a moment. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord why in the year that King Uzziah died? Are there not times that a king will be very close to a prophet and they're very intimate and they're very friendly and so the prophet might see too much of that king 
and the king might be too near to that prophet that what the king sees will be a little bit limited because it's still too much of that king until the king comes out of the way. But it was in the year that King Uzziah died and Uzziah was out of the way that I saw the Lord. Don't you know that as bright as the sun is, S-U-N, the sun in the sky, if you took a piece of coin, not broader, not bigger than your wristwatch, if you hold the wristwatch of a coin far away, and you look up, you'll still be able to see the sun because that coin is far away from you. And the nearer you bring that coin, you bring that coin, you close one eye, and then you bring it very close to your eye, that little coin can shut off the light of the sun. How many people have some small, insignificant things very close to their mind, very close to their eyes, and it shuts off the sun of righteousness. And it shuts off the glory of the Lord. And it shuts off the vision of the Lord in their lives. You see, in leadership, there are times a man may be so close to you and it shuts off the glory that the Lord wants to reveal. There is a time that a woman, I'm not, we're not talking about committing sin. And we're not talking about even doing anything evil at all. We're not even talking about any appearance of evil. There's no evil. There's no sin. There's no fornication. There's no touching. There's no evil. But the woman is so close to you, closer than your wife, perhaps. But you are not committing sin. There's no evil. Just intimate. Just loving. Just affectionate. And she's so close to you, and it blocks off the vision you ought to have. And sometimes, it's another thing. It's money. And it's not that you're earning money in an illegitimate way. But the money occupies a position in your life. And until nothing dies off, it shuts off the vision you ought to see. Or sometimes, it's another thing. It may be a desire for position. And it may not even be pride. It may just be, I want to be useful to the Lord. I want to be useful to the Lord. I want my ministry to count. I want to be significant. I don't want to pass through the, the world as a bird passing through the air. I must do this. And that desire becomes so strong. It becomes like the little coin that is close to your eyes and it shuts off the vision, the revelation, the glory of God. It was in the year that King Uzziah died that now Isaiah was free from the intimacy of that king and from the influence of that king that then I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple above it to the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face. Why would the angels have to cover their faces with their, with their wings? Because they didn't want to be so familiar with the glory of God. And with twain he covered his feet. Why? Because the place you stand is holy ground. And with twain he did fly. Why? They must be swift and quick and fast in running errands for the Lord. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. He saw the angels. He saw the Lord. He heard the sound of their voice, holy, holy, holy. And then he saw the glory of the Lord filling the whole world, the whole earth. 
and then he felt the moving and the shaking of the posts of the door and the voice of the angel that cried and then he saw the smoke but then his attention all went away from all those great things glorious things and marvelous things and went to the very condition of his own heart the minister will see quite a lot of things glory vision angels the minister will hear a lot of sound the sound of the voice of angels or maybe of the rushing wind or the minister may see the effect of the fire coming spiritual fire coming upon the tabernacle the temple of the lord but if the minister is going to get prepared for the for the wonderful ministry that the lord has called us to he must see the lord and see himself he must compare his own unworthiness or contrast his own unworthiness with the beauty of the holiness of the lord that's what helped isaiah if he had concentrated on all the other elements of the vision of the revelation he will not have become the minister he became the prophet he became the leader he became he saw himself and as we have come over here during this week and we, we see the glory and we hear the wonderful messages and we hear the shouting and the praying of the people and we can see the glory of the lord filling the whole place yet all that is not going to do everything it ought to do in our lives until we turn our eyes inward i've seen the beauty of his holiness now i see the worthiness in my own heart then said i woe is me for i am undone because i'm a man of unclean leaves and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves i say what are you telling us here? Isaiah is saying, I've been a prophet. I've been a leader. And with the message I gave in chapter 1, I thought I'd arrived myself. Because when you read about the message of, of Isaiah in chapter 1, that was a man that could speak with authority and with conviction. And then he comes to chapter 2. And you'll see what he's saying in chapter 2. He's even looking into the future. He comes to chapter 3. And he comes upon those daughters of Zion. How the daughters of Zion are haughty. And walking and mincing as they go. And I will smite you. Because of the worldliness. That man hated worldliness. And when he preached against worldliness. He thought he had arrived himself. He was alright. He was okay. And of course those people when they prayed. They thought that everything was now alright. And he comes to chapter 5 and he says woe unto you all you people that are strong to drink wine woe unto you and the people that put evil for good and good for evil woe unto you that man had authority and power he had anointing and he preached the word of god when he see the when he saw the glory of god and he saw his himself instead of woe unto you and woe unto them he said woe unto me i didn't know that my heart is like this i thought i'd got everything i ever needed and I thought I was the greatest prophet in the land. And even my people, my church, even my congregation, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. It's now that I see, when I hear the voice of the angels, and I see that the only thing coming out of the mouth of the angels is only holy, holy, holy. When they're in the presence of God, holy, holy, holy. While they're flying swiftly from the throne of God, and they're going to deliver the message, holy, holy, holy. And when they get to the people, they're delivering the message on, holy, holy, holy. When they finish their message, and they're going back to the throne of God, to the presence of God, holy, holy holy and then as i said what look at these angels they, there's no vacation from holiness and there is no leave from holiness there's no holiday from holiness every time whether they're in heaven or they come to minister on earth or they're in the sky or they're flying about anywhere they're going everything is holy transparent holiness and perpetual holiness and permanent holiness is said what am i doing who do you think do you do i think i am i thought i'd arrived woe unto me i am a man of unclean leaves 
when I stay on the pulpit and I declare the word of God against worldliness and against all the carnality of the people, when I declare the word of God, I declare it very well. When I come out of the pulpit, I'm surprised about the way I use my mouth. I'm surprised about the way I use my lips. Woe unto me. And then look at all my congregation. When they, when they come and I'm declaring that word to them and I tell them, come now, let us reason together. Says the Lord, if your sins be as scarlet, I'll wash them white and snow. When I declare that word, I see their response. I see them crying. I see them sober. I thought they were all right. But now that I see the glory of God and I look at my congregation, look at my congregation, I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves. And because they said that, and because he was concerned, he was yearning for holiness. He was yearning for purity. That's why we read in verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. I pray it will come upon our mouth. And said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves. Thine iniquity is taken away. You know, when you pray, and it's not just your mind telling you. And it's not just your thoughts telling you. And it's not just me, the preacher, encouraging you. Your iniquity is taken away. You are praying. That's enough now. God has answered your prayer. When it's not me. When it's not any of our leaders standing here in the authority of the preacher telling you your sins are taken when it is the voice of an angel from heaven. When it is the voice coming straight from the throne of God and is telling you, lo, this has touched thy leaves, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. Then you can have assurance. If I tell you, that's not enough. If the other preachers tell you, that's not enough. If your mind tells you, that's not enough. When a voice comes from heaven, and that voice from heaven tells you, your sin is purged. And then he had in verse 8, and it says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And I tell you, without this, Point in chapter 6, the ministry of Isaiah would not have grown beyond chapter 5. Yes, we have ministry, a limited ministry indeed. And some people will say, if I wasn't qualified, why would I be in the ministry? If Isaiah wasn't qualified, why would he be in the ministry? Why would he preach chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? But that's a greater thing. There was a higher thing that the Lord wanted to call him to. And when you read Isaiah, you will know, you will tell. And I said, do I have time to tell you? 66 books in uh, chapters in Isaiah. There are 66 books in the Bible. And Isaiah, when you look at the first part, there are 39 chapters in the first part. There are 39 chapters in the Old Testament. And when you look at the second part of, uh, the, of Isaiah, you are going to find 27 chapters. There are 27 chapters, 27 books in the, in the New Testament. When you look at the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, you are going to see the wanderings and the unfaithfulness of Israel. When you look at the Old Testament, 29 books, 39 books, you are going to see the unfaithfulness and the wavering of uh, the people of Israel. When you come to the uh, second part of Isaiah, 27, 27 chapters, you are going to see the glory and the comfort and the grace that came upon the people of Israel. When you come to the New Testament, you are going to see those 27 the books of the New Testament telling you about Christ and the comfort and the grace and what Christ has come to do. When you take the uh, second part of Isaiah, 27 chapters, I said, when you take the middle chapter, uh, the middle chapter of those 27 chapters, you are going to land on Isaiah chapter 53. That's the very center of that second part, and it's talking about Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. When you come to the New Testament, the very central figure in the New Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you something that the ministry of Isaiah became more significant than any other ministry in the Old Testament because it went through chapter 6. And it was a punctuation mark in his life and in his ministry. 
if he didn't respond very well to that chapter 6 of Isaiah, his ministry would have been limited. But because of responding very well to the experience of chapter 6, that's the reason why his ministry became extended unlimited. Holiness in the Christian leader. The leader's holiness experience. Actually, that's exactly what God wants. And those are the people he wants to put in leadership. In 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. From verse 35. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 35. And I will raise me up a faithful priest. That shall do according to that which is in my heart. And in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. And he shall walk before mine anointed forever. In leadership, the Lord is looking for faithful people that will do according to which, according to that which is in the mind of the Lord, in the heart of the Lord. That's holiness. When in every thought, in every plan, in every interaction, in every relationship, in every discussion, in every message, when you are in the church, when you are outside the church, you are conscious of the fact that the Lord has called you. And you are looking unto him who has called you. And it is in your heart. In small things, in big things, in open things, in secret things, in public things, in private things, with men and with women, with money and with material things, with the Bible and with any other thing, anywhere you are, anywhere you find yourself, and there's one word that is ringing in your heart, faithfulness. When people are there, when people are not there, there's one word that is ringing in your heart, faithfulness. When you know that this thing I'm planning, this thing I'm doing, others will never hear. Others will never detect. And the leader, the pastor, the, the overseer will never know that I was the one that did this thing. When you know that, and yet you know that the one word in your heart is faithfulness. And that you will do according to all that which is in the mind of God, which is in the heart of God, that's holiness. And that's exactly what God is saying he wants. He says, I will raise me, raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is my, in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. I'll give him a, good, a great ministry. And a, a good ministry. A, a ministry that will not be blown down but all, by all the circumstances around. And then he tells us in, a, in that passage of scripture, and he will walk before my anointed forever. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, chapter 8 rather, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind to control them. I will put my laws in their mind that they will walk by my law and my law alone. And then he says, I will put my laws and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. When the law of God reaching on your heart has more influence of you, more than the opinions of men, more than your own personal private desires, more than the habitual things you are used to doing. And more than any other desire, any other, any other, any other uh, thing you have in your heart, any pursuit. And the only thing is the law of the Lord reaching in your heart. And when any temptation comes, there's a part of that law in your heart that speaks out. I don't you remember this verse of scripture? You cannot do that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I cannot do that. And then another thing comes. Maybe it's your mind that wants it. Or it's your body that wants it. And then yeah, not the law of God reaching upon your heart will come up again. How about this part of scripture? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I cannot go that direction. And in fact, sometimes uh, you have uh, somebody came to you and he caught you unawares. My brother, my sister, can you uh, do this for me? All right, I will. And then after you said, I will, the law of God came up in your heart again. Ah, uh -huh. you said you will, but you didn't check up. How about this verse? How about this path? You called out, I'm sorry. The promise I gave you, I cannot. I'm a special person. 
I'm a set apart person. I'm a separated person. And I have a covenant with my Lord. I'll be faithful to my Lord. Before I promise to you, I promise the Lord. And the first promise I made to the Lord, my first covenant with the Lord, and my first commitment for the Lord, so, star, uh, stands more than the promise I made to you. That greater promise to the greater one, to the heaven, to the to my heavenly Father, will displace your own the promise I made to you. I'm sorry, I cannot do that again because of the law of God that is reaching upon your heart. That is the holiness the Lord is talking about. Uh, you come to the Lord and you are sanctified, and then after that sanctification, He writes His law in your heart. Uh, there is nothing like you know some people they say they are sanctified and there's no difference between the time they said they were saved and the time they were sanctified and if you ask them what's the change in your thought what's the change in your mind what's the change in your disposition what's the change in your temper what's the change in your way of doing things what's the change in your reactions when people do things to you What's the change in your response when you hear the word of God? What's the change in your prayer pattern? What's the change in the content of your prayer? What's the change in your desires, in the things you want? Now you say you are sanctified, they can't tell any change. Because the, the, the things, the desires when they desired when they were saved, is still the same thing they desired as they say they are sanctified. And the same reaction, the same response they had to the problems of life when they were saved, is still the same reactions they have now that they say they are sanctified. And the same way they will deal with you if you offended them when they said they were saved, it is exactly still the same way they will deal with you if you offend them after they say they are sanctified. There's no difference. And they do not know the difference between sanctification and uh, and salvation and but the lord is telling us when he sanctifies us and he gives us holiness of heart things are going to be different i will put my law in their mind and i will write it upon their heart so that you'll be able to follow the lord with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind in hebrews chapter 13 reading from verse 20 hebrews chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 20 now the god of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. And there are some, maybe because of their ignorance, and you shouldn't be ignorant if you just took the concordance and you look for the word perfect, perfect, perfect. You're going to see that many, many parts of scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. And the Lord is not, uh, the Lord does not encourage us to shy away from the word perfect. Because you see, there are people who do not know the mind of the Lord. And when you have the mind of the Lord, perfection is your goal. Perfection is your pursuit. Perfection is your desire. Perfection is your consecration. Perfection is your delight. You want it. You want to be perfect. And the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood of Jesus in the atonement make you perfect. In every good work to do his will, accord and walk in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I come to point number two the leader's home expression. If a leader is going to be the leader, according to the New Testament standard, the home expression must help him to preserve his leadership in first timothy chapter 3 reading from verse 1 first timothy chapter 3 verse 1 this is a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop he desireth a good work a bishop then a leader a worker a servant of god a bishop then must be blameless the husband of one wife as he talks about the holiness of life, blameless, he talks about the home, the family of that bishop, of that leader. He must be a husband of one, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, giving to hospitality, apt to teach. Already you will see, in fact, he puts the husband of one wife before the ability to teach. And there are many people that reverse that. They concentrate on the ability to teach. And they, it may be that it's the woman that is a great, great teacher. And because there are times that God gives uh, women to such gifts. Because they are to teach the younger women too. 
And they are to teach them to love their husbands. And they are to teach them to be discreet. They are to teach them to follow good things. And there are times those women can teach very much effectively. Apt to teach. But they do not understand that the home comes before the ministry. And there are some of the women that will concentrate. I want to be useful to you. I don't want to go empty handed. I want to serve the Lord. I want to make use of my gift. It's not only my husband that ought to serve the Lord. I am going to serve the Lord. I've made up my mind. And even if I neglect the home, if I neglect my children, if I neglect the care of my husband, that doesn't matter because the work of God comes first in my life. Ah, you are not reading your Bible. The husband of one wife, that's the home. And it's after that you have the ability to teach. And there are many you that neglect the home. And they say, I'm working for God. I'm working for God. Actually, you need to understand as we read the Bible, eh, there are many things that need to be corrected. And there are people that are in the service of the Lord. Take, for example, eh, you're somebody is transferred away from a particular place, location. Maybe when they were in the first eh, location, the woman had established something and it's work, money. Or maybe whatever thing. And then the man is transferred. And you are now in another location. And say, well, I made my commitment. I'm going to serve the Lord. My wife, how about this? Uh, you're asking me. Look at the establishment here. Look at business here. Look at the poultry I established while I was here. And you know chicken. If you don't take care of it. And I don't trust any of these people to take care of this poultry for me. I, I cannot go now. You go. It's you that has got the ministry. And the man not understanding the scriptures, he has ability to teach. And then he goes to the place where transferred him. And his wife is taking care of poultry. The poultry is more important than the husband. The chickens are more, they are more delicate and more precious and close to our heart than the husband. And the husband is being exposed to temptations over there in the place that he had been transferred. But the temptation does not matter. Even if that man falls into sin with a woman, that doesn't matter. The poultry here is more important. But the Bible is telling us that your home is very, very important. The home expression of the leader. And then he tells us, not giving to wine, no striker. And not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house. One that ruleth well his own house. My dear brother, how do you rule well your own house? You've been transferred and you're in a faraway place. Far, sometimes you're a missionary. You're a missionary in another country and your wife and the children are here in Nigeria. Are you, are you going to control them and rule the family with GSM? Your telephone? All that you are doing over there, and that's your place of ministry. Why is not your wife with you? And here is the word of God. He that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. How do you do that from another country? Your, your children, your wife, they, everybody is there, and then you are over there. How do you do that? And then it says in verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And he's not only talking about missionaries. He's not only talking about the people that are transferred. He's talking about those of us in the city. You know, sometimes you are not even on full time. You wake up very early in the morning. You go to your place of work. You have to do that. And then while you are coming back, your branch, you go to the district church. And then your wife will cook your lunch for you and put it in the flask. That's in the car. When you get to the office at lunchtime, you take your lunch. And then after that, uh, when you are coming back, you just, just go straight to the district. A lot of things are set to the district. Children are at home. And the wife is at home. And by the time you come back, uh, if it's, there's no Bible study that day, by the time you come back, the children are asleep. And from Monday to Friday, that's how you, how you, how you live your life. And yet you are the husband of this woman. You never care for her. And the woman never sits down with you. No quiet time together. No discussion together. No interaction together. It's only when you want babies, you get near. But is that Christianity? Is that the way to practice leadership? 
your home expression that we will understand that if we were to go by all and we should go by them many of us will be disqualified with all the characteristics and the great great things we say we're doing and all the things if we were to ask your wife and we say sister sincerely are you happy you are married to this a great preacher coordinator if your wife were to be sincere your wife would say why are you asking me you want me to commit myself and say so what i don't mean you want to you want me to say yes it's a great man we never have any time together i cry all my tears i shed all my tears alone and i bear all my bodies alone and even though we're sleeping in the same room we really i don't know you say he, he doesn't know my heart he doesn't know what i'm going through even though we are here together and you see even when we are coming to church would you believe it pastor if i'm still trying to take care of the children my husband is so special i say well if you don't hurry up i'm going to church and we have only one car in the family and my husband is going to take the car and go to church and the rest of us can you imagine it pastor that we are behind the family my husband will go to church without me without the children and we have to be following the public transport he is not taking care of the family. And if you ask me that question, whether the man is qualified or not, hey, don't ask me the question. I don't, I, don't, I don't want him to say that I am the one that removed him from the ministry. Go and ask him. He'll remove himself. We're not qualified. We're not doing the right thing. And we're not taking care of our families. One that truly let well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. What if I tell the sisters who are here that if you are the one paying house rent, you should stand up. Don't stand up. If I were to say that, a lot of sisters here will stand up. If I were to say, ah, sister, you are standing, your husband is not um, a believer and doesn't know it's his duty. Oh, my husband is a believer. Your husband is a believer but not in deeper life therefore he doesn't understand the teaching of the bible ah my husband he never misses any meeting in deeper life okay because he's not a worker he's not hearing all this if attending congress who is the husband of this woman and then the man shows up and it's one of a great dynamic people but he doesn't have money to pay us rent doesn't have money to feed his wife or to feed the children it's the woman that is doing all the work and paying out straight and you know uh, paying the school fees of the children and uh, doing everything in fact is one that is even putting clothes on the body of the man the man cannot clothe himself but the preacher dynamic preacher great great preacher and when he comes on the pulpit and we tell him to talk about the family and teach the people about the family, he will lay it line upon line, precept upon precept. You know why? His priorities are misplaced. He knows book, but he does not know life and the requirements of the Lord. If a man cannot provide for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. How do we put somebody who has denied the faith to come and be teaching us the scripture and to come and be preaching our retreat? Do we have time to check up? Brother, you will teach this message at the retreat. Before I give you the topic you are going to teach, tell me about your family. Are you taking care of your wife? Do you have work? Are you paying house rent? Ah, uh, Pastor, it's my wife that has been paying house rent for the past five years. Are you feeding them? Unfortunately, well, and you look robust. Well, that's the handwork of my of God and in my in my wife. It's my wife that my wife is enterprising, and my wife can do this and do this. I about you, I'm a prayer warrior. Only praying. And it's the wife that is doing the work. I'm sorry, I cannot give you the message I wanted to give you. Go and settle your home. We cannot give a man that is worse than an infidel. 
and give him chance to come and be blowing grammar on our pulpit. It's wrong. Check them out. Are they following the scriptures? The home expression of the leader, of the Christian leader, if he does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. And it's worse than an infidel. And let me tell you something. There are some things that happen in the Old Testament. And those things, they were allowed and permitted. The Lord just said, the new day is coming. The new covenant is coming. The new testament is coming. Allow them to just, just go ahead and do what you want to do. We'll get you out of the way. And then the new dispensation will come. That's why you read in Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 21 and verse 22. I'm not going to read everything, but you'll see what I want to read. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, verse 22, but I say unto you, in the old, this is what they said, but now I say unto you, Verse 27, it says in verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Verse 28, but I say unto you, In the past, this is how they did it. In the past, this is how it worked, but now, here is how it is known. Verse 33, in verse 33, again, ye have heard, it had been said by them of old time. In verse 34, but I say unto you, things are different now. Verse 38, ye have heard that it had been said by them, an eye for an eye, and it stood for a tooth. But I say unto you, in verse 43, in verse 43, ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. You see, things are different now. Why am I pointing that to you? You must remember David now. As you remember David, you know he committed adultery. And he remained on the throne. That was then. We can't do that now. You remember Samuel? Samuel? The two sons of Samuel, they were not serving the Lord, and they were taking bribes. Now, and Samuel remained a prophet. It cannot happen now. It was like that then. But now I say unto you, do you remember Aaron? Aaron reared up the idol for them to worship. And although he was corrected and rebuked, but he, was, he remained the high priest. But we cannot do that now. It was said to them of all time. Here is the permission they gave them at that time. They were in the kindergarten. And they didn't know any better. And they were told, okay, go ahead, go ahead. We'll soon get you out of the way. The first covenant will soon get out of the way. In the second covenant, if your family is not as it ought to be, you are disqualified for ministry. How should it be? I want you to look at um, this, uh, this couple again. I'm reading from Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 18, you are going to meet these people, Aquila and Priscilla. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18, and we're looking at uh, verse uh, 24. In verse 24, is certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And uh, he and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had had, they, both of them, took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of the Lord more perfectly. Aquila and Priscilla, you always see them together. That's a perfect example of how the family should be. How the family should be. Uh, do, do you know there are people, so-called Christians, when they transfer their wives to Abuja from Lagos here, they say, okay, you can go. What will happen to the children? Well, I will get a maid. And if you didn't know the brother, you'll think that this maid is actually the wife because the maid is living at the boys, at the boys quarter and then the wife is far away in Abuja and the wife too is so happy and contented. I got promotion. They demoted you when they removed you from your family. 
They destroyed you. When they removed you from your family. And you're telling me you got promotion. You're over there far away. And your husband is here. And your teenage children are here. Growing up without the care of the mothers. Unfortunately. I'm not saying unfortunately because your, your children are girls. Unfortunately. These daughters. These girls. They do not have the care of a mother. And it's the mother that understands the daughters very well. And the mother is in Abuja there, walking and getting money and phoning. Are you doing well? And then let me talk to the maid. Are you cooking for daddy very well? Is it the maid should be cooking for daddy very well? You left your place, you didn't know. They took your cry away from your head, you didn't know. And they took your very life away from you, you didn't know. They took your right hand away from you and cut it off without even any anesthetics. And it doesn't pay you at all. Something is wrong somewhere. But let the families come together. And let us know we have a Christian family in the church. The man and the woman. Let the people of God put the family above money. Let the people of God put the family above making it in life. And sometimes the, the corporation or the farm that you are working with will transfer the wife. And they transfer the wife out of the country. And the, you know, and the husband will be giving testimony. Praise the Lord. Something is happening in our family. Where my wife is. Well, we have been praying for promotion for a long time. And you know what they did now? They transferred my wife. And now she's signing. You, you know what she's signing? Hard currency because now my wife may why my wife is walking in fact it is so wonderful and I'm sitting here in Nigeria and my wife is over there is that a testimony they are destroying you and you are laughing and rejoicing they're killing your family and you are rejoicing because in the plan of the Lord, in the economy of the Lord, the man and the wife must stay together look at Aquila and Priscilla look at Romans chapter 16 in Romans chapter 16, I'm reading from verses 3, 4, and 5. Romans chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Did you see the first passage I read to you? Aquila, uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Over here, Priscilla and Aquila. Here is the woman. Can I tell you something? I've seen, I see a lot of things and you people think because I keep quiet that I don't see. Yes, of course I see. Sometimes the, 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 the man is a coordinator and the wife is a women coordinator. And in fact, most of the cases is like that. And the man will be so jealous of the success of the wife as a women coordinator. That if uh, the woman wants to plan anything, because God has given the gift of speech to that woman. And when she gathers the women together, and, motive, and you cannot talk to those women about dressing like your wife can do. And you cannot talk to those uh, women in the church about taking care of their children and about all their duties like your wife can do. But when the woman is planning that program and the man is uh, going around and the man sees how his wife is effectively giving the word of God to those women and those women are so in rapt attention and nodding their head and saying amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah and then the woman begins to lead the prayer and those uh, women they prayed, ah look at this this woman will outshine me if I am not careful in this district, this woman is going to take my position and so um, when the woman comes back home and says hey, daddy God visited us today. Uh, I, I know you are praying for me. You know, we had a wonderful women program today. In fact, I didn't expect something like I know you. It must be your prayer that helped me. Uh, the man will just keep quiet and look still. Will not say positive or negative. After the woman had finished all that, well, uh, can we eat now? Or is it women program? You know, we are going to be discussing for the rest. No food on the table, only women's program. Uh, daddy i'm sorry i'm you know i'm just telling you how happy i am you know that i didn't know that i i'm i'm, I'm hungry oh. and then after that uh, any maybe another month or two the sister now said uh, daddy we uh, in the this this women well, i want to do a follow-up uh, no there's no time now because these women are very busy monday bible study they are there on uh, thursday they are there on sunday they are there we don't want to over them 
and then you, we don't want to overlabor them. They start today that the woman wants to meet with the women there. The man will go behind and announce on the pulpit. Everybody, men and women, no separation, I want unity in the church, fellowship in the church. All the men, all the women, this Saturday, we must be there. And the woman is thinking about this is the Saturday I gave my husband. And my husband said, we don't want to overlabor the women so much, they are too busy. And my husband went to plant something to cancel that program. It's jealousy. Why don't you do like Aquila and Priscilla? And when your wife is helping those women in the women ministry, it's part of the church. And it is helping the work of the Lord. And it's making progress. And encourage her. So that all this jealousy in the family and the subtle cleverness that is trying to put the other one down will remove that. The wife should not be jealous of the husband. Neither the husband jealous of the wife. They work together in unity. That's the Christian family. We are talking about the leader's home expression in verse 4. Who are for my life laid down their own necks. Unto whom or not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles likewise greet the church that is in their house. I come to point number three. The leader's heavenly expectation. The leader's heavenly expectation. You see, for a real child of God, you are desirous of heaven. You want to get to heaven. That's your desire. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, reading verse 10. For he looked for a city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. That that should be the passion, the pursuit, the desire in the heart of the believer, of the child of God in Psalm 73. Psalm 73. We're looking at verses 24 and 25. Psalm 73, verses 24 and 25 the pursuit the desire the expectation the passion in the heart of the minister of the leader here it says in this psalm 73 reading from verse 24 thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and unto what receive me to glory whom have i in heaven but thee and there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. That's the desire to get to heaven. And if we want to get there, by the grace of God, we will be there. But here is what it takes in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully it's holiness that will get us there follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord will see the lord all that we need has been made available and the blood of jesus can cleanse and wash us whiter than snow if we will sincerely call on the lord and i know we have been praying and say lord what you have given me in this congress the holiness of heart the holiness of life and all the adjustments and all the cleansing that i still need to have according to the experience of isaiah do it for me and the lord will do it for us let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer